Hi, I'm Safia Noble. I'm an associate professor at UCLA in the Departments of Information Studies, African American Studies, and Gender Studies, and I co-direct the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. I've written a book about uh, algorithmic discrimination, specifically the ways in which data gets used and deployed in a variety of kind of discriminatory uh, and sexist ways. I have that book around here somewhere, Algorithms of Repression. And I want to share with you a little bit of insight uh, from my book uh, today. And uh, before I do that, I just want to congratulate Michael and Marcus on this conference. I know that it's been a long time coming. I wish I was with you in Las Vegas. Uh, we could be celebrating right now um, all kinds of uh, uh, success uh, from panelists throughout the day. But I will um, just say that um, it's still so important that we have these conversations, particularly for those of you who are working in data science and machine learning uh, and predictive analytics, because there are, um, as you know, are so many harms that are coming from these technologies. And so uh, I want to maybe do a little bit of framing today with you about the consequences of some of these technologies, things that I've learned from my own research and from the research of others. Um, I certainly would recommend for those of you who are interested in learning more that you um, pick up, uh, you know, new books that are out. Here's Ruha Benjamin, Race After Technology, another excellent book that you could um, uh, think about as you are designing your machine learning algorithms and thinking about AI of the future. Now, obviously, so many of our relationships are being remade with AI. Uh, machine learning and predictive analytics are playing a huge role, in some cases, life or death kinds of roles um, in our lives. And I think that in the rush to uh, extract as much data as possible from the public and from consumers, from users of various technologies, um, and in using a variety of different kinds of data sets that exist to optimize uh, current projects, there's a tremendous amount of harm that can also come from that work. So uh, while my talk is better uh, followed by a visit to the bar, I find that the five o'clock hour is a great hour to hear a talk from me. I hope that you will um, settle in wherever you are uh, for this very brief conversation and open yourself to the possibility of thinking about um, where data scientists and people working most closely with data uh, that comes from a variety of different places might be able to be on the front lines of mitigating harm against the public. And so I want to talk for, for a few minutes about that. Now, one of the things that um, led me to this area of study was that I had spent 15 years in advertising and marketing for Fortune 50 companies and brands. And I really understood social media and search platforms and other kinds of media platforms as advertising companies driven by advertising logics uh, with a, a mandate, quite frankly, to maximize shareholder return. And uh, when you have models that are optimized for profit, one of the things that happens is that there are many casualties uh, that come along with that kind of imperative. So in the case, for example, of studying, um, I'm looking at the cover here, uh, in the case of studying things like large scale search engines, one of the things that I was particularly concerned with is the way in which the public engages with something like a search engine as if it is kind of a neutral, credible, reliable information broker. Um, in fact, in a search engine, which those of us who've worked in any kind of corporate capacity around marketing or advertising, we know that, in, that we are um, paying to optimize content and to be, make the products and services as visible as possible. And that uh, placement is actually tied or uh, ranking is tied to optimization. In fact, as I was leaving the advertising industry, you know, we used to hire uh, freelance programmers to help with uh, search optimization. And now, uh, you know, so there are thousands and thousands and thousands of 
uh, advertising analytics and SEO kinds of companies around the world. So a lot has changed in the uh, 10 years since I left the industry, but uh, in many ways, a lot of things have remained the same. One of the things we know, for example, is that communities who traditionally have been vulnerable to uh, corporate practices uh, where they might experience harm um, are continuing to be harmed. So let's take, for example, um, a, a, a very kind of commonly understood uh, type of discrimination that happens in financial services or banking or insurance industries. Here you have multiple industries where um, for decades, if not centuries, people were um, systematically discriminated against, whether that were uh, African Americans, Latinos, indigenous people, women most certainly who were unable to, uh, for example, access credit without a father or a husband's signature on a bank account. Um, and it, now these things are not so old in terms of these practices. My own mother told me stories about how she was unable to get her own bank account when she was a grown woman uh, trying to uh, bank at a very large popular American bank um, and could not open a bank account without her husband's signature. So think about these kinds of historical pr practices of discrimination where people have not had agency and have not had power. Communities have been systematically redlined, which is to say um, zoned out of participation in a variety of different kinds of financial products. Or because they lived in a particular zip code, they paid a higher insurance premium or they paid a higher interest rate on a loan or mortgage loan. If you're interested in this, I strongly recommend, there was a great article that Tanahishi Coates wrote for The Atlantic called The Case for Reparations where he gives a very detailed history of redlining in Chicago in the housing market. And one of the reasons why it's important to understand these historical practices, which some of which are continue on in our contemporary, uh, whether it's a large scale social media company that might be um, only showing housing ads to a particular profile and screening out people of color, for example, which by the way is against the law, uh, against federal law. Um, these practices, in fact, are uh, becoming more and more typical in the way in which uh, machine learning algorithms are using historical data and forecasting some of these practices of the past directly into the future. And this is one of the reasons why I often tell my computer science students at UCLA who take classes from me that, you know, you really have no business designing technology for society and you know nothing about society. Um, many times as I'm teaching my students, for example, uh, histories of uh, discrimination, they uh, are stunned. Uh, and then I can see them thinking uh, through what it means for them to use, let's say, historical purchasing data or um, uh, long-term credit uh, profiles when, again, we're talking about people, some people, women, half the population of the United States who hasn't even been able to become unencumbered from their own credit profiles being associated with the men in their families. And we saw this, of course, with our uh, founder of Ruby on Rails, who uh, recently received um, his Apple credit card and with the same profile as his wife. In fact, his wife had a better credit score than him. He was offered 20 times the credit of his wife. Now, when people, when media uh, personalities ask me, how could that happen? When, you know, how does the algorithm um, discriminate in such a, a, a patently obvious way? To me, it's quite uh, evident that when you have women who've only been able to have their own credit lines independently for 40 or 40 or 50 years, um, they don't have as long, we don't have as long historical data as we do about men in our society. And we could take this across a variety of different industries, um, whether it's healthcare. We know, for example, that we have incredible disparity in our healthcare system. We have people who have um, private employer insurance, for example. Um, those who don't have employer provided healthcare are in 
uh, second tier public health uh, uh, environment uh, and system. And um, therefore the data is quite different that gets collected in those systems as opposed to, let's say, um, the robust kinds of precision medicine uh, and data profiling that happens of patients at UCLA. Uh, so UCLA Medical. So these are all kinds of systems where data is being generated, but they are generated in these disparate um, circumstances. And one of the things that I find so interesting when I talk to data scientists and people who work in machine learning is they really don't care where the data comes from and they don't care what, it, what the context of the data is and what the meaning of the data is. And one of the problems there, of course, is that if you have past discrimination and that is borne out in the kind of data that is collected and created from those kinds of practices, social practices, economic practices, political practices, then you will indeed predict those practices into the future. That is one of the most frightening dimensions to me of the future of machine learning and the way in which we need to rethink data science education and the type of work that companies and industries are doing. Now, of course, one of the other interesting dimensions that I think is on the horizon is that there's a talk about regulation all over the world, at least it's certainly in Europe, in the United States and in South America. Um, we're seeing more and more a push, Australia, uh, certainly, um, in every sector, data is being optimized um, through a variety of diff different business practices. And um, those are happening in the context of other kinds of broken systems. And so um, we have a tremendous opportunity, I think, to look carefully at the kinds of analytics that are coming into view. Certainly, governments um, and a variety of different boards and commissions around the world are being established to look closely at the um, consequences, um, be they intended or not, and who will be accountable and who will be responsible for the disparate impact, for the harms that come from predictive analytics that, uh, and patterns that might uh, only be recognized through big data analytics, but certainly um, will continue to have disproportionate harm. Just a few days ago, in the UK, for example, we saw um, the way in which AI was deployed to help determine who will go to college and who will not. And it prioritized and favored, those analytics prioritized and favored kids who were already going to private school. So these are kids who are already um, uh, uh, well off, uh, upper middle class uh, or who have extraordinary access that the majority of kids in the UK do not have. And those, those pathways that determine, or let's say over determine um, what we might be able to do in our lives is really increasingly being constrained and controlled and determined by AI and algorithms. And this is the place I think we will see tremendous amount of uh, public policy, regulation and um, interrogation. And I see these as an incredibly risky investment by companies who might be thinking about short-term uh, profitability that can come from extracting as much data as possible. But of course, um, the longer-term consequences of that on democracy, on opportunity, equal opportunity, and um, possibility uh, is extraordinary. So what are the things we can be thinking about? Well, for sure, I think as you think about this uh, conference that you're attending and the workshops you're participating in and the networking that you're doing, I would be thinking about what would our products look like? What was our services look like if we centered people who might be most harmed by this? Who Do we even know who might be most harmed by the kinds of products and projects and services that we're bringing into, an, into existence. This is incredibly important. Uh, we need to know that, and those are important questions to be asking. Now, many people I know and companies say, well, we leave that to marketing. That's not my responsibility. 
I'm just a data scientist. I'm a computer scientist. I'm working over here uh, in a place where all I can do is deal with the data that comes to me. I have no accountability or responsibility for the data that I'm handed. And I think that, that um, we will increasingly find that to be an insufficient um, answer. Indeed, we see tech workers all over now in large uh, tech companies in particular who are refusing to put their work in service of harmful technologies. And I think that there is a real opportunity for tech workers to be empowered and to be knowledgeable. Um, and I don't just mean people who work in the tech sector. I mean people who have technical skills that get deployed in all kinds of industries. This is an incredible opportunity and a time to become um, powerfully educated about uh, what it means. And, and indeed, the way in which uh, the kinds of projects that are coming online might deeply alter the way in which we come to understand ourselves as human beings. And so I'll leave you with one more um, advice because I'm just a, that's what professors do as we assign books to students. But if you're interested and you want to be a student of this kind of game, um, this is a new book that just came out. Uh, it's called Technologies of Speculation, The Limits of Knowledge in a Data-Driven Society. And this is by Sun Ha Hong. And uh, uh, I've, I've had a chance to hear um, Dr. Hong speak about this work, and it's utterly brilliant. Um, you know, it's really thinking about what does it mean when so many kinds of predictive analytics, so many different types of data come into um, contact with each other, new data profiles about us are made, and um, uh, we come to know ourselves only through the relationship to these predictions. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite fascinating, and I think that there's a lot to discover. I know that my time is short with you, and so I think what I'll um, uh, leave it uh, with is, is to invite you to ask the right questions. Uh, and if you're not sure what the questions are, I uh, can guarantee you that there are plenty of people in the academy right now, certainly our team at the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry, um, and we have partnerships and, and colleagues around the world, Cambridge, Oxford, NYU, um, uh, University of Western Australia, uh, where we're looking critically at the harms that can come from a variety of machine learning and um, predictive uh, machine learning processes and predictive analytics. You know, we know quite a bit about the shortcomings of data and uh, it's worth uh, not taking on the risk, not only of the harms, but also of the liabilities that uh, are tied to um, sloppy uses of data and um, harmful deployments. And so with that, I want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to share a few quick thoughts with you. It's just so brief, but I hope that some of this will be a, pro a provocation for you as you enter the workshops over the next few days. And um, certainly we're um, always interested not in just being critics of industry, which of course, um, you know, many of us, our work is pointing out the harms and dangers, but we do that because we see ourselves in an ecosystem with a lot of different kinds of people in the world, people working in companies, people working in government, um, act, community activists and organizers, parents, um, students, people who uh, come from all walks of life who are interested in um, the way in which uh, society is made uh, in, in fair and egalitarian ways. And you know, I'll just close by saying one of the things, one of the lines from my book is uh, that we have more technology, I'm sorry, we have more data and technology than ever. And it's true, we have more data and more technology than ever, but we also have more global, social, economic, political inequality to go with it. So we had these promises that these technologies would be liberatory, that they would free us 
from inequality, that they would bring about heightened levels of democracy and participation. And what instead we see is that many of the kinds of technologies that now are here um, with us are harmful and, uh, and eroding social equality and in fact um, undermining global democracies. So uh, I invite you to ruminate over some of these uh, ideas. And uh, we have a resource page uh, on our center site at, at C2I2, kind of like R2D2, C2I2.ucla.edu slash resources. And um, on our resource page, there are plenty of books that we think are really worth uh, uh, reading at the intersection of race, society, and technology. You know, this is such an important moment. The whole world is standing up for racial and economic justice, and um, everybody has a part to play, including those who think that their work is benign and has no material effect. Um, there's no industry that is not implicated in some way in either moving forward and um, opening up possibility and opportunity for people or shutting down and foreclosing on opportunities for people. And so I invite you to um, consider where your company stands, where you are in those conversations. And with that, I want to wish you a very uh, successful conference and uh, hope to be in touch soon.